There was a lot of subtle stuff happening under the surface in this week's episode of Game of Thrones Eastwatch. Let's break it down, shall we? <sighs> For the first time in seven seasons, we got our first close look at Eastwatch, one of the three functioning castles remaining to the Night's Watch. This is where Tormund and the Wildlings have set up camp, and where they were keeping the Brotherhood Without Banners imprisoned. It'll also be the home base for the mission north of the Wall to go capture a white. Hopefully we'll get to see our very own Suicide Squad return safely back there in the next episode. Sansa's clothing has long contained subtle and not-so-subtle messages about where her allegiances truly lie, and this episode was no different. On the behind-the-scenes HBO website, costume designer Michelle Clapton revealed that Sansa's wide leather belt is so much more than just a simple accessory. It's a direct message to the clever Lord Baelish. We've all heard the prophecy that Maggie the Frog made to Cersei in her childhood about how many children she and the king would have. The king will have 20 children, and you will have three. That doesn't make sense. Gold will be their crowns. Gold. Shrouds. Maggie's not referring to the children that they would have with each other, since Robert and Cersei would never actually share a child, unless you believe a certain crazy theory that Gendry could actually be Cersei's child. Instead, Maggie is referring to the three babies that Cersei has with Jaime, Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen. That's it. Three. Finished. No less, no more. Cersei may be pregnant again, which is giving Jaime a much-needed infusion of faith in his and his sister lover's cause, but if the prophecy is to be believed, she'll never bring another child into the world again. Fans of Jon Snow and his lovable direwolf companion Ghost often find themselves wondering, where the hell is that dire doggo anyway? Now Sansa's finally given us an answer. As she's explaining to Arya about what it's like to deal with the opinionated northern lords, she tells her little sister that these proud men won't sit and wait patiently for Jon like Ghost. So we can conclude that Ghost is safely running around the woods of Winterfell, waiting for Jon to come home and keeping the CGI costs down. As the maesters sit, choosing to ignore Bran and Sam's very real warnings about the Night King and the Army of the Dead, one of the maesters mentions Jenny of Oldstones. It brings to mind the work of Jenny of Oldstones, the charlatan who claimed descent from the children of the forest. <laughs> this character is a popular one among storytellers and songwriters. She was a common woman, one of the small folk, who claimed to be descended from the children of the forest. It's this claim that the maesters find so laughable. <laughs> Prince Duncan, the son and heir of Aegon IV, fell so madly in love with Jenny that he abdicated his throne in order to be with her. Jenny of Oldstones was also friends with the same woods witch who prophesied that the prince who was promised would be descended from the line of Aerys and Rhaella Targaryen. Oh, <laughs> the maesters also laugh at the memory of the supposed prophet Lodos, a king of the Iron Islands who was believed to be descended from the drowned god. During the conquest of Aegon the Conqueror, Lodos called on great krakens to appear and destroy Aegon's fleet. When the Krakens didn't appear, Lodos and thousands of his followers filled their robes with rocks and walked into the sea, hoping to rejoin the drowned god. Lodos' followers were found dead, washed up on the shore, but Lodos himself was never found. Some decades later, another man on the Iron Islands claimed to be Lodos reborn. The Maester's skepticism of any and all forms of magic seems to be a nod toward a popular book theory known as the Maester Conspiracy. In short, this theory suggests that it was the Maesters, the most learned, respected men in the Seven Kingdoms, that purposefully tried to eradicate all magic from the world. Some suggest that it was the Maesters that poisoned the last of the dragons, and suppressed wargs and skin changers from learning about their powers. The show hasn't had time to delve too much into this idea yet, and with Sam having hot-footed it out of the Citadel, it doesn't seem like they'll ever get the chance to go back to it. Still, it's a nice hint at the larger world of A Song of Ice and Fire. Jon Snow boldly decided to pet Big Drogon on his tremendous nose. Drogon acted downright docile, sensing Jon's Targaryen lineage. This calls back to the other surprising dragon tamer we saw in Season 5, Tyrion. Don't eat the help. <laughs> Since we know that Jon is a Targaryen and assume that that's why Drogon acted so chill, is this even further evidence for the theory that Tyrion himself is a secret Targaryen bastard? Gendry wastes no time in picking up his hammer and swinging it around, <laughs> calling to mind the fabled stories of his father, Robert Baratheon, wielding his warhammer in Robert's Rebellion. 
While Gendry and John were quick to comment on their similarities as the bastard sons of former BFFs Robert and Ned, and put their trust in one another, Our fathers trusted each other. Why shouldn't we? The truth is that John isn't Ned's son at all. He's the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, whom Robert Baratheon killed at the Battle of the Trident using a warhammer scarily similar to the one Gendry has now. While the show seems to be setting up a fast friendship between these two, is it possible that their relationship will wind up more closely mirroring that of their real fathers? We could use the help. Okay, you'd have to be as deaf as Khal Drogo in a coma to miss Gilly name drop Prince Ragar and his annulment and remarriage, which is 100% a reference to Rhaegar Targaryen annulling his marriage to Elia Martell and marrying Lyanna Stark, meaning that Jon Snow is a bastard no more but a legitimate Targaryen son. As the son of the Crown Prince of the Seven Kingdoms, this makes his claim to the Iron Throne more valid than his aunt Daenerys's. For now, Jon has no interest in the Iron Throne, but if something happens to Daenerys, could he be persuaded to take it anyway?